Um, you know, as we just heard a lot about how do we best, uh, uh, you know, start to do some uh, restoration. And restoration, that word takes on many forms, whether it's stocking eggs or juveniles or adults, habitat recovery, changing laws and policies to regulate those anthropogenic uh, impacts, and even a variety of social programs to engage communities into, into conservation. And, you know, why do we need to take these steps, or how do we do it? Um, we, need to, we need to understand what that baseline is. We need to understand what's going on. You know, we can't just do all things at once. We need to kind of dip our toes into, the, into lots of waters before we know what's the right one. Um, when you start a, a big restoration project, we need to understand what's going on. We need to move from that assessment from the baseline to those restoration measures. And then once we start building those results, we get a picture of the whole story. And we can use those results to kind of change our, our approach as we go. So this is a, a map of, of Atlantic Canada. These are all the national parks throughout Atlantic Canada. And um, we're working in, in five of these parks. Um, so Fundy National Park at the bottom, where we just heard where a lot of work is that uh, Ian was just talking about, we're just beside that river. Um, Kujwaquak National Park, so these are both in New Brunswick, Cape Breton Highlands in Nova Scotia, and then two in, uh, in Newfoundland. And, you know, when we started looking at these parks, you know, getting a baseline, um, you can see that there's a, a gradient of populations across these parks from uh, critically endangered to that inner Bay of Fundy population where, you know, at the bottom corner here, really we had 25 plus years of single digit or even no uh, fish returning to these rivers, all the way up to Terra Nova, which is relatively healthy having, you know, 2,500 plus uh, fish returning annually, and there's even a small retention fishery now there. Um, so Fundy Park, Fundy National Park is really the epicenter for a lot of our restoration work, and so I'm going to be talking a lot about that today. Uh, Pete, you know, he talked about uh, these red-listed species yesterday, and of course, uh, this uh, inner Bay of Fundy population is one of those. It is the only salmon population in Canada that's protected under the Species at Risk Act. And so, you know, that obviously is the impetus for a lot of work, but once you start looking at these populations across the region, you know, something bigger is going on. And in that panel discussion, we talked about setting aside parks um, and, uh, you know, these pristine areas and assigning these red, yellow, green um, kind of light approaches. And you can see that's what Parks Canada does. Um, but just because we set it aside doesn't mean that there's going to be salmon, and, and that's what we're seeing. So we had to develop some sort of intervention strategies. So the first one, and, and really what started a lot of this off, is the Fundy Salmon Recovery Model. Um, so this is where we collect those out-migrating smolts, um, the few that are left. Uh, we take them to uh, the world's first marine conservation farm. So we're really the idea is to put them into the marine environment, protect them from that high at sea mortality. So right now, you know, we're at about 0.05% smolt to adult return rates in the inner Bay of Fundy, so they don't really do well. So once they're mature, we put them back in the river uh, to spawn naturally. And so we want to um, allow for all those natural processes that, uh, that Ian was talking about. We want to increase that egg deposition. And the offspring that are being produced are, you know, have no captive exposure because they're born in that river, they hatched in that river, and so we can continue that cycle to try and rebuild the population. Uh, Ian talked about having that, the arriving liker effect and what we were starting with. We started with 18 families. That's all that was left in the population, so we were starting uh, really depressed. Um, not that the whole story is depressed, but the population was. Um, so there's two parks that are employing this similar strategy, so Fundy National Park and Cape Breton Highlands. Uh, the difference there is they're rearing some of those adults in a land-based uh, facility. Uh, Kujukak is trying to, uh, they're putting out some egg boxes, so doing some egg stocking, and they're starting to see some increases in survival there. And Terra Nova, I think, is a great example of how you can recover a population through these social, social events. So their population was starting to go down, um, primarily because of poaching. They started a working group with their local, local uh, communities, and through that, they were able to bring that population back, stop that poaching, and now they have that uh, retention fishery. There's one river in Gross Morn that is really depressed. Population, they're down to about 13 adults. Again, poaching is the suspected cause there, and so they're starting a working group uh, similar to Terra Nova. So, you know, we do these restoration activities, and so what, what do we get out of it? So uh, since 2015, we've released uh, just over uh, 5,700 adult salmon, endangered adult salmon, back to Fundy National Park. Uh, in 2020, we were able to start doing this in two rivers. 
Um, and so it's not just us, Fort Folly First Nation, who are partners in this program and have a, a program on the pet Kodiak. Uh, so far, they've released over 6,800 adults. So these are a lot of endangered adult salmon back to their, to their natal rivers. And of course, through these releases, we're starting to see positive results in our returning salmon population. So you can see when we started this full-scale project back in 2015, uh, there was really nothing, nothing in the river. That peak in 2012 was from a pilot project. But what you can see is since, since we started this project, we're starting to move that needle and, and the adults are slowly starting to, uh, to come back to the river. And having those adults back in the river is meaning that we're starting to increase our juvenile densities. Our juvenile population is responding at, you know, uh, at the same time. And so early on, there was some juvenile stocking, traditional juvenile stocking from a hatchery. Uh, that didn't really result in, in increases in production. That, those blank gaps doesn't mean there was no fish, they just weren't electrofishing. Um, but once we started putting adults and allowing for the natural selection to happen, natural mate selection, natural processes, we're starting to see those juvenile populations increase. And our two rivers are right now the only two rivers in the entire inner bay of Fundy population um, to have exclusive wild hatched juveniles. So there's, none of the juveniles came from a hatchery, they're all wild hatched, and that's really important. But remember, we're, you know, we're looking at salmon restoration across these five parks, and we start taking a look at uh, some of these other parks, we start to see patterns emerge that are you know, very informative. So with the adult salmon release strategy and Fundy, after five years of, of recovery, there's about a three-fold increase in the number of juveniles um, in that river. So you can see here where we started when that population collapsed in the, in the mid-90s, and just how few juveniles were left. And what we're seeing is Trout River in, in uh, Grossmore National Park, that one river that had 13 adults come back, you know, it's at the point where restoration action is critical. And, and so the road to, road to recovery in Fundy National Park is long and hard and very expensive. And we're seeing these similar trends in, in declines in other parks and other rivers that can help tip us off to maybe avoid the, the catastrophic collapse that we had uh, in Fundy National Park and in the Inner Bay of Fundy for that matter. I think this is the the value of looking across such a, a, a big area. Um, any of you who know me know that I can't talk about salmon or other anadromous fish without uh, bringing marine-derived nutrients uh, and ecosystem function into the conversation. So Kate is a grad student, and she's using stable isotopes as a bioindicator to assess ecological function across, across these five parks and these various restoration strategies to better understand what role salmon or how salmon can be used as a restoration tool um, for different ecological functions. And so she collected um, samples, so uh, biofilm, leaf litter, periphyton, um, epiphytes, invertebrates, fish, and putting them all together in this isotope map, if you will, uh, to paint a picture of how they function as a whole. And so when you add salmon back to these rivers that didn't have salmon, now we can just see you know, what and how big of an influence these, these salmon, these keystone species, there you go, Jason, may have on freshwater ecosystems. So this is just, just hot off the press. Uh, Kate just got these samples uh, not that long ago. And as Sammy showed us yesterday, there can be a lot of differences uh, in food webs just within a system, within a river system, not to mention across these systems. And so we're trying to look at relative changes in, these, in this isotope space or these polygons, if you will, we want to see, um, you know, how do these relative changes with and without salmon, as well as differences in time, so with, before and after salmon are there. So really, what influence do salmon have? So this is what you see here, these different polygons mean different times, so either upstream or downstream. Upstream just means there's a barrier on the river, so above that barrier where there's no salmon, downstream where salmon can access, and then before or after salmon spawn. Those black dots are actually the salmon, those are this, this, the returning salmon isotopic signatures. And what, what I really want you to take away from this is that when you look at those red polygons, those red shapes, those are the areas in the river where adult salmon can spawn or are spawning, and this is the time period of just post-spawn, so when there will be most of these nutrients in, in the system. And uh, what you see is, in, these, in, the, in Fundy National Park at least, you see a shift in the productivity, a shift in the ecosystem function um, towards these salmon. But what we're seeing is salmon are influencing how these rivers function ecologically. And so unlike uh, Cape Breton Highlands or Kujibaquak National Parks, where they have very few salmon still, uh, you don't see that same shift. And so 
And what we see is that once salmon are, you know, in Fundy National Park again, in, in ecologically relevant numbers, and I think that's important, that the numbers are ecologically irrelevant, these rivers are functioning in a manner that we would expect uh, in a relatively healthy river. So something like that in the mirror machine. So on the far left, there's a study we did in 2018 showing a similar pattern of ecological shift or ecological function as a result of having salmon in the river. And so not only putting salmon back in the river is great to have more salmon, but we can actually change how the rivers function ecologically. Um, like I said, in that kind of adaptive approach, uh, or this uh, restoration approach, you know, adaptive management and learning is a, is a big part of this. Um, and so we wanted to see, you know, um, when we release these adults, when we rear these adults, does it matter? And it, again, it goes to what Ian was saying. Um, so we have fish raised in our conservation farm, so in a marine environment. We also have fish in, in a freshwater hatchery, at the same hatchery uh, that, that Ian was talking about, the Mackquack Biodiversity Facility. So we had sea reared and freshwater reared. And then we also looked at how we release them. So uh, do we put them out very, you know, using a helicopter here? Um, or can we do, do we just put them in by hand? Does that matter? How we put them in the river, does that matter? And then we looked at, that, looked at that across the two rivers in, in Fundy National Park. And so we did this in 2020. We, we paired it as well as we possibly could. And then in 2021, we went and did our electrofishing, collected those uh, um, uh, fry samples, and then looked at their genetic analysis to see which parents from which strategy were successful. And what we found was, like he had said, where you raised matters. So fish that were raised um, in the marine environment produced four times more offspring than their freshwater hatchery counterparts. Um, the other thing that was interesting was where you were born matters. So adults that were, came from fish that were born in the river, so wild hatch smolts, produced one and a half times more offspring than adults that uh, originated from traditional uh, unfed fry stocking. So that, that, those two things really, really matter, it seems. Um, reconditioned hatchery kelp, so adults that were spawned in the freshwater hatchery, held over another year and then released, uh, obviously you see did not perform very well at all. Um, so that was something that was uh, interesting for us, I guess. Um, and surprisingly, there was no significant difference in spawning success between releasing fish from a helicopter or, uh, or by hand. So who knew that the salmon like helicopter rides as much as I do? It's pretty fun. Um, some, some of the interesting things that came out of this, though, was, was you know, we had 34 uh, unidentified parents. So 30, 30 unknown fathers and four unknown mothers. And so I think... Um, for, for many of those unknown fathers, it's likely precocious par, so we're getting those precocious par into the, into the spawning plan, if you will, into the natural spawning. Um, the unknown mothers, I think, is a little bit more interesting. Uh, where did they come from? Um, obviously, it's strained from, from somewhere. We do know that some, of, some fish from other rivers uh, have been identified in our river through, different, through, through tagging, so we know there's some, some strain that's occurring. Um, but we don't know where all these, these, uh, these fish are coming from. And so that's kind of the next step is who's coming from where. And to get at the uh, genetic diversity uh, aspect, again, we started with only 18 families. That's all that was left. It wasn't that we just took eight feet, 18. That was it. Um, and we just started, we just looked at the, the genetic diversity that kind of affect the spawning population number. Uh, and we're now up to 32. So we're getting new genetics into this population from somewhere. Where, where they're from, we don't know, but it, we haven't lost any, and I think that's a really important thing. So, um, I guess just to summarize, you know, for us in Funny National Park, and, and really the rest of the inner bay of Funny Rivers, it's, it's not about conserving what is left, because there's really nothing left. For us, it's really about, you know, trying to rebuild what, what was lost, that lost population. And so we're really starting with, with very little, and, and you know, we're slowly moving that needle into that positive direction, um, but we still have a, a long, long way to go, but I, I think we're on the right track, and we're, we're trying to incorporate as much of the new information and what we know about conservation rearing and strategies into these programs to, to minimize our effects, really. We're trying to produce the best quality fish possible, and, and I think we're on, we're on to that. So, you know, we're increasing adult returns, we're increasing juvenile production, we're, we're creating uh, better functioning rivers and ecosystems. Um, so all in all, I think we're, you know, we're on, on the right track. You know, I, 
I'm really fortunate to be able to come to, to, you know, to these meetings and speak on behalf of our, you know, our collaboration. It's large, it's diverse. Um, you know, there's 14 different organizations and countless numbers of people that contribute to this. Um, you know, it, it, it's a huge effort to, to try and rebuild these stocks. And, and you know, yesterday we talked a little bit about engaging those policy policymakers. And you know, there's a picture of a whole bunch of law enforcement. There's six different you know, provincial and federal law enforcement agencies who actually work together to protect these fish. And it may not sound like a lot, but um, to bring that many different law enforcement agencies together to work together is, is no small feat. And uh, I'd love to say I had a, a hand in that, but I really didn't. It was, the, it was this, uh, a couple of the Parks Canada wardens who, who did that. And so that's just one, one small thing. Um, you know, we use Department of Fisheries and Oceans helicopters, so they're involved. So there's, it, we can't do this without, without working together, and I, and I think that says a lot. Um, and just to follow up a bit on our panel discussion yesterday, you know, it is that sheer power of collaboration like, like this that allows us to, to reach these new heights in, in conservation and restoration and, and really even make those policy changes that, that are needed and that we're talking about. And with that, I thank you all very much.